Good morning. Let's go ahead and open up to the book of John. John chapter 7 is where we're finding ourselves today as we travel through the book of John. We were in John chapter 6 quite a while, I believe five sermons there. It's one of the longest chapters, if not the longest chapter there in the book of John. And uh, just to kind of catch us up to date, John chapter 6 uh, begins with thousands and thousands upon people. Uh, many theologians would estimate over 20,000 following Jesus. The number of men is 5,000 people following Jesus there in chapter 6. And then they are uh, ascribing to him all kinds of great accolades, right? They refer to him as the prophet who was to come, which is announced from Deuteronomy. Moses said there's going to be a future prophet that has come, the greatest prophet. You must listen to him or else you will die. So they're saying Jesus is this new prophet. He's performing signs and miracles. They refer to him as rabbi, which means teacher. They even want him to be the king of Israel, like right then. They're willing to take him to Jerusalem, kick out the Romans. They want him to and be the king of Israel. So all these great accolades, they're following him to a desolate area. Uh, they follow him then across the sea, and they hunt for him until they find him there in Capernaum after he's already fed them. Uh, so you have followers of Christ. They refer to themselves as disciples of Christ. John even refers to them as disciples there in John chapter 6 as well. And so they're saying these wonderful things, but by the end of John chapter 6, we see something amazing happen. 99.9999% of all those people who were followers, disciples, calling him rabbi, the prophet, the king, are gone. Uh, what happens? Well, he begins to teach very clearly that he is exclusively the way to heaven. There is no other way. He reveals to him or teaches that he is indeed God. And uh, what do they do? They leave. They do not come back. They abandon him and we're left with 11 people taking out Jude, right? There's only 11. So not all who follow Christ truly follow Christ. Not all disciples of Christ are truly disciples of Christ. And false followers of Christ pick and choose what they want to believe about the person of Jesus as well as what teachings they would like to follow. This kind of seems to be very indicative of those that were supposedly following Jesus. A true follower of Christ acknowledges Jesus for who he truly is and honors all of his teaching. All right? So that's what we really looked into last week in examining yourself. Make sure you're a true follower of Christ true disciple of Christ and not just following the crowd that is supposedly following Jesus, that you are under his teaching, submitting to his authority. Now let's continue in today's passage. We're going to pick up in uh, chapter 7, verse 1, and we'll go through verse 13. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 13. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews, Feast of the Booths, Booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him going on among the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. Let's pray. God, thank you for the word that you've given us to, to look into today. May it shape our beliefs. May it shape our behaviors, Lord. Uh, we thank you that indeed you've sent Jesus into the world to save sinners such as us. And it is to him that we look, Lord, for our salvation. We thank you, God, that even though we are sinners who have sinned against you, you have given us grace through Jesus Christ. And you've given us this great salvation. Help your word to shape us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if we go back to verse 1 there in John chapter 7. Uh, after this is how it begins. And kind of after what might be the question. But of course, after what is the chapter 6 to a degree. All right. So uh, after the miraculous feeding of the thousands of people, 
then turning away the thousands, all those that left him, uh, Jesus spends about six months in Galilee. And so Galilee is north of Jerusalem. It is kind of mocked and made fun of to, to a degree by the, the uh, Jerusalem Jews as they're kind of Galilee, kind of the way we would, we would think of it today in terms we might call them country bumpkins, all right? Uh, in Arkansas, we use the word redneck, so if you're offended by that, uh, that, that that's where I'm from. That's what we would kind of call the, the you know, the, the, they would call them more kind of uneducated or kind of country bumpkins. That's where the Galileans were. So Jesus, after this, the feeding of the thousands, after everyone turns away, he spends about six months in the region of Galilee. And we see this very successful ministry because in the book of Acts, you have 120 believers, and they all appear to be basically from Galilee. They're described as Galileans, all right? Now, uh, we find multiple places where the Galileans are kind of smeared. So if you want to quick, quick, well, Acts chapter 2. Let's just turn over there, Acts chapter 2, quickly. Didn't really have, have it up there. I was going to turn to it, but I'm going to turn to it anyway. Acts chapter 2. There when, on the day of Pentecost... Uh, when, when Jesus sends the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, we see the, on chapter 2, let's look at verse, look at verse 6, verse 6, all right, if you look at verse 6, you begin to catch where the Jews were slighting or kind of, uh, making fun of the Galileans who supposedly God was using, right? Look what they say. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So here we see the gift of the Holy Spirit had come. Uh, he has empowered them to speak in languages, known languages of all these people that are listed here. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? So this is, the, this is again, it's, it's a dig at the Galileans. They were considered uneducated. So how are they speaking in all these other languages? Look at verse 8. He lists them out here. Uh, pardon me if I get the names wrong. Uh, and how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, uh, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya be, belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome. So all of them heard the language in their own, the, what God was telling them to say in their own language here. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues in the mighty works of God. So now they're making fun, like how could this possibly be? These are not the educated scribes from Jerusalem. These are not the Pharisees. These are not the Sadducees. These are mere nobodies from Galilee, completely uneducated. God wouldn't use them, right? But he is, and he's instantly given them an entirely different language. How long does it take to learn a language? Many of you have tried and are still trying the English language. You know, <laughs> It takes a long time to learn languages, right? Uh, but here, they're instantly given this ability. They're speaking in all these languages, the mighty works of God. Then you see the next dig here. It's... Uh, Let's see, look at verse, uh, where are we going to do 12? And one another, what does this mean? But others were mo others mocking said, they're all filled with new wine. So it's not, we, you might have seen that before, not noticed that, but you have two digs against the Galileans there. Uh, they are uneducated, they're saying, how could they know these other languages? And they're probably just drunk Galileans, all right? So the two digs there. And then even if you turn back to John, go back to John, chapter 1, verse 46, you see one of his, uh, soon to be disciples, um, uh, also digging at Galilee as well, kind of just, just mocking them. So this is where Jesus is spending six months of his ministry, though, all right? John chapter 1, verse 46, Nathanael said to, said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And we took note of this as we were going through it, uh, that, that Nazareth is part of Galilee. All right, so here, here is Nathanael saying, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything could good come out of Galilee, right? Anything of God has to be done in Jerusalem and come out of Jerusalem, not, not over there in Nazareth. Yet, this is exactly where Jesus was ministering for six months. And we often find that Jesus is not ministering to those who thought that, that we think or they, they thought should be the ones he's ministering to. He did not come for the upper echelon of the religious crowds, right? 
He went out. He sought out, sought out the sinners. He, he is the physician who is looking for the sick. So six months he spends in Galilee. Now, what was he doing for these six months? John just skipped right over it. I mean, you go from chapter 6 to chapter 7, you don't know any time went by. And John has a different purpose for writing his gospel. Overall purpose is the same, but versus Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're going to give the six months there. Uh, John is going to spend a vast majority of, of his gospel in the last few months of Jesus' life. 40% of it is spent on the last one single week of Jesus' life. So he is, he is definitely compressing the gospel. He's only going to cover like seven uh, miracles, I believe, in the entire thing. He's compressing it down. But if we look over here at Matthew, we get a glimpse of what happened during these six months. All right, Matthew chapter 15, verse 29 through 31. Look over there with me. Matthew 15, 29 through 31. And here, I'm just going to take a little bit out of Matthew here so we get an idea of what's been going on for the last six months that is leading to Jesus' appearance at the Feast of Booths. All right, in verse 29, Matthew chapter 15, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. Again, this picks up that Galilean ministry. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there, and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So we see that lots of supernatural signs are performed during this time. John believes that he has made the point sufficiently enough uh, with the signs that he is going to list. These are supernatural signs that can only be God has validated this person, authenticated the message by giving them these signs that he has provided enough. Matthew is giving more detail here. Uh, we also see that it's an important time of teaching for his disciples. He spends a lot of time privately teaching his disciples during this. Matthew 17, just turn over a couple of pages, 22 verse 20 through verse 23. This is a much repeated topic that Jesus is teaching on during this time. Mark, Luke, and Matthew record this. He is constantly seeming to have to cyclically teach his disciples about his coming, death, burial, and resurrection. So look at verse 22. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. All right, so Jesus had to teach often about this. Why? Because they, they really didn't like that message, it seems. They had to keep, keep hearing it, keep hearing it. Then even after Jesus is arrested and dies, uh, what do the disciples do? Aha, this is exactly what Jesus told us was going to happen. No, they panic and they go hide in a room and they don't know what to do with themselves. Finally, there in, 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 uh, in Luke 24, right, we find out that Jesus had to come back, of course, appear to them, and he has to remind them, hey, this is what I told you, remember? And they're like, oh, yeah, we remember. Now, some people, it takes a, takes a lot of lessons to learn, all right? But they've learned it eventually. But So Jesus, during those six months, lots of signs and wonders, lots of teaching, and lots of time with his disciples individual, individually investing into those disciples, all right? So verse 1, go back to John chapter 7. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Uh, we find that out, that the Jews were trying to kill him at John chapter 5. After healing the man on the Sabbath day, that was it. The Jews wanted him dead. They wanted to kill him. So they were actively looking for him to kill him. So he remains there in Galilee, not going into Judea. Now look at verse 2, John chapter 7. Now, the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. Now, and, and as you read the New Testament, as you read about these booths, or even in the Old Testament, if you're not real familiar with the Old Testament where God prescribes, mandates, creates the law about these feasts, the New Testament feasts don't make much uh, uh, matter in your mind, like right? what's going on. But yet we find out these feasts were very important, and they act like 
uh, they are a type or a prophecy about what is going to be accomplished by Jesus Christ in the future. And so we see that they, that's exactly what happens. Jesus is going to fulfill these feasts in and of himself and the work that he accomplishes. But to get a little history here, and we did this not too long ago when we looked at the Passover, but go to Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. These are not emphasized that much now because this time has gone. Jesus has fulfilled them, and they are not required by that, the law as they once were. But there were seven feasts that the Jews had that were prescribed by God. Three of them uh, were mandatorily required that no matter where you went, no matter where you and your family moved off from Jerusalem, you had to come back to Jerusalem three times a year for these three feasts, at least a male representative from your house, all right? Where do we find that? Here's a couple of places. Deuteronomy 16, 16 through 17. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. All right, so here are the three mandatory feasts. And these feasts between Deuteronomy and the time we pick them up in the New Testament, you do see a little bit of a name change, but they are celebrated on the exact same dates every single year. Uh, the name changes just a little where the New Testament, we see that this, the first feast here described in Deuteronomy 16 uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is kind of shortened to just be called the Passover, all right? And uh, that was kind of the prime, the primary day of, of that feast. And we see, of course, that Jesus is our Passover lamb. It is the night of his betrayal that he is taking of the Passover when he introduces what we just had, the Lord's Supper. And it's through him, right, his flesh, his blood, that we have forgiveness of sin. So we see that fulfilled there. Uh, next, we have that Feast of Weeks there in Deuteronomy 16, 16. Uh, Feast of Weeks was also later nicknamed something else. Uh, it was 50 days after the Passover, and it was eventually called the Pentecost, right? So it's 50 days. So that's, the Pentecost becomes a Feast of Weeks. So even with that, we see this amazing thing take place where Jesus dies perfectly on Passover, and then 50 days later, he said he was going to send the Holy Spirit to indwell in believers and he does that according to this feast day. And both of those mandatorily required dates, Jerusalem would have been packed. So it was packed to the brim for the Passover. And then they go back to their separate places. Then they come back after Jesus has, has died and res risen from the dead. And he gives the proof of his resurrection from the dead as they're all back there again. And the gospel goes forth in all the languages where they have come back from as a sign to get the gospel, not just to the Jews, but to every one of these people in their languages, right? We were just looking at uh, William Tyndale on Wednesday night and uh, his life and his story and how the, the word of God had been, had been just, just, just handcuffed, shackles around it for so many years until finally you have some great guys come along who translate the Bible into the languages of the people out of Latin, which no one was speaking at the time, into such as the English language that we have now. Why? Because we need the Word of God in our language. So we see that happening there on the day of Pentecost. The languages are being spoken uh, supernaturally. God has empowered them to do such a thing. Lastly, the feast that we're on today is the Feast of Booths. Sometimes in the Bible, this is referred to as the Feast of Tabernacles as well. Turn with me there in the Old Testament to Leviticus 23 for a little bit more description on this particular feast. Leviticus 23 40 through 43. All right, Leviticus 23, verse 40 through 43. And here we have the, uh, the requirements uh, that God gives for this particular feast, the third one. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. 
It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites dwell, shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. All right, so here we have the description of the Feast of Booths. All right, now what is a booth might come to mind. Uh, basically, it is a temporary structure. And so they would bring, they would come to Jerusalem packing sticks, limbs, branches, etc., leaves, and they would literally, in this metropolis area of Jerusalem, they would construct what we would call a tent, a temporary dwelling place. And it's kind of like a reenactment of when God brought them out of Egypt. And God gave them the tabernacle, but also they had to, they had to uh, dwell in temporary structures around the tabernacle. And this is to recall, kind of like we did today, right? We take the Lord's Supper, we remember uh, of, of what, what Christ has accomplished for us, but we also look forward to what is his future coming as well. The Feast of Booths is kind of like that, where they're, where they're looking back at how God took care of them, provided for them during this time. They review those lessons, and as we'll get to in a couple of weeks here, the, the lessons that Jesus goes into the tabernacle, the temple to teach in John chapter 7 are the very lessons that would be reviewed during this time. So they're reviewing that, but also this is, this is something else greater is going to happen, right? With the dwelling of God and the dwelling of man. So this was a very popular feast. People came from all over. Uh, males were required, but also it, it's fun to camp out. So you had lots of families involved on this one, all right? So supposedly this was the most popular uh, time. And even if you had a dwelling place, you had to put the tents on top of your dwelling place, on the roof, the flat roof. So everyone in the Jerusalem, all the Israelites came back, and everyone is camped out everywhere. This is the big-time camp out, bigger than our church camp out, all right? Tents are everywhere. I don't know if s'mores were invented yet for this, but it was a big, big camp out. Now, um, these feasts are no longer required and have been fulfilled in a greater way by Jesus Christ. As we took note earlier, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost for the great harvest. Jesus tabernacles with believers by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So all three of these that are required have now been fulfilled by Jesus Christ on behalf of his people, and they point to a greater spiritual reality that has taken place. But again, this is important because it makes sense as John is recording this, uh, what, that, that everything is happening around these, these huge epicenters where everyone is in Jerusalem. He's already had two Passover times now. Uh, first Passover there that John records, he's overturning the temple tables, right? He's uh, teaching at that time, performing signs. Uh, he records one other Passover, and that will be it. The next Passover will be when he ha has the Lord's Supper with his disciples and then dies. So this is six months before that happens. Now, let's go into verse 3. So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Now this is John chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. Uh, now the unbelieving brothers of Jesus were giving him advice. Is it a good idea to give God advice? You know, if, if, when you think about who Jesus is, he probably doesn't need their advice. Um, but also the, a good point of reference, a point of application here is always be cautious when taking advice from a non-believer as they have completely different worldviews, motivations, hearts, desires, and reasons for their choices. Uh, we should be very cautious when unbelievers want to give us advice. Not saying that it's all unsound advice, right? It could, could be good. Uh, some, some advice in certain areas. But if you're having whatever it is, uh, uh, struggles with children, struggles in marriage, etc., should you go to the unbeliever uh, and seek advice on how to do these things? You need to be very careful with that, all right? And probably not do that. But again, you, you, so you need to be very cautious with that. Uh, Jesus does not need their advice, even though they think he does need their advice. How many of us sometimes think we need to advise God on what he should actually be doing in our lives, right? 
Sometimes we do that as well, maybe secretly, not publicly, but <laughs> God, you know, I need this. And the brothers did not believe in him. We also see there in verse 5, and uh, they did not believe in him, which is, is uh, you're thinking about this, like they, they know him, uh, they grew up with him, but yet they do not believe in him. Now, this is interesting. Do they believe that he is a real person? Absolutely. They're, they believe he is a real person. Uh, that does not equal salvific belief. Uh, today, many times, people get confused and think because they believe Jesus was a real person, that that counts as believing in him. Did his brothers get attributed for believing in him? No. But they knew he existed. They grew up with him. They're talking to him. They're speaking to him. They're having a conversation with him. But they do not believe in him. So acknowledging that Jesus existed did not and does not count as saving faith, all right? Uh, also in this, this passage here in verse 4 and 5, we uh, see that Jesus did have brothers. Uh, he definitely had brothers. Here they, it's definitely a given. It's not hidden at all. Uh, this is not taught that often. Much, much of the reason is, uh, not, not to just, just pick on them, uh, but the Roman Catholic Church for years and years did teach and has taught that Jesus did not have brothers. But... I just point them over to verse 4 and verse 5 here, verse 3, and it's like, so his brothers said to him. It should clarify a lot, right? So his brothers said to him. And uh, they'll, they'll say, well, they were just talking about Christian, Christians in general, then the part of the family of God, but we know that's not so either because there's other places that list them out in detail. So they kept the, the falsity going in order to meet the story that they came up with Mary, that Mary was a perpetual virgin, all right? She could then, there, that she could not consummate her relationship with her husband. They did not have that type of a marriage, and she was a perpetual virgin, and eventually she was assumed into heaven, right? And part of the deification of Mary, if you will, assigning her divine attributes. So they had to do away with this, this the, what the Bible is saying here about Jesus having brothers. Now, obviously, they were not full brothers as far as God and man, but they were half brothers, the same mother. All right? Uh, now, if you look at Matthew 13, hold your place here in John chapter 7, turn over to Matthew 13, and just to see this, again, again, taught, if you ever have questions about this or someone you know is uh, speaking about these things, it's, it's really easy to prove biblically that Jesus had siblings. And this is one of those things that should have been clear to, to them as well, especially as the Bible got published in languages that everyone could read. There's no reason to do away with this information unless it goes against the theology that was made up beforehand. Uh, look at verse 53 through 55, Matthew 13. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there and coming to his hometown, note where he's at, he taught them in their synagogue, so they were astonished and said, Where did this man get his wisdom and mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? So they know him. He's in his hometown. They know who his father is. They know the father's occupation. Look at 55. Is not his mother called Mary? They know his mother's name. And are not his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Again, there's not a lot here, a lot of meat to chew on as far as application, but just to get the point across, this is clearly there, all right? Uh, he's in his hometown. These people speaking know his dad, know his dad's occupation, know his mother, and know his brothers. They know these details about it, all right? So the Bible is not trying to hide this. There's no attempt in the Bible to deify or lift Mary higher than we should, that is proclaimed here. She is a, a good, good woman. We definitely have that there. She is living righteously, uh, but there's nothing about her being assumed into heaven or being a perpetual virgin and never consummating her relationship with her spouse. Nothing like that exists, all right? So did his brothers remain unbelievers? Did the brothers of Jesus remain unbelievers in the, point, the obvious point is going to be no, they did not. We find that, that several are going to be great leaders in the church. Go over to Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 12 through 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. We find out. And some of those original 120 believers are now his brothers. 
who are going to be speaking in languages and the fl flames of, of uh, fire on their head in just a moment, being a witness to everyone. Look at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, the Simon the Zealot, and Judas the sons of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So the same brothers that we have over here in John, that are trying to get Jesus to go into, the, go into Jerusalem for the temple, uh, toward, towards the temple for the Feast of the Booths, and uh, there are not believers, John clearly says that, they become believers. And they're here in this original crowd of believers. So a good point to take home from this is, Remember that just because someone is not a believer right now, it does not mean that they will remain that way for life. All right? So we must show them much grace, much mercy in the meantime, and always remind yourself that you are not always a believer. God gave you grace. God gave you mercy. The Holy Spirit has regenerated you and brought you to life, and we give God all the credit for our salvation so those unbelievers in our life, we have to continue to treat with much grace, much mercy, and much patience because God could definitely save them. Look at Saul, right? We always use him as an example. Here is a guy arresting Christians, hating Christians, willing to kill them, have them stoned, whatever, and then, boom, he is radically, radically saved. So when God moves, he can move instantaneously and radically change someone's life. Uh, the brothers of Jesus who did not believe also contributed two books uh, of the New Testament, right? James and Jude. Those are the two of the brothers of Christ. Uh, James goes on to become the head of the church in Jerusalem. So very prominent in, in church history there. All right, let's move on to verse 6, John chapter 7. So at this point, they're unbelievers. Jesus said to them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always here. Here we just briefly mention that Jesus is on a perfect time table, and he is doing everything that God has commanded him to do. Uh, he's just kind of saying that, yes, you can go into the Feast of Booths whenever you want to, but God has given me a very specific time timetable that I am on. Verse 7, uh, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify about it that its works are evil. So here we find out Jesus knows that the Jews hate him, obviously. He knows that they are wanting to kill him, and that's why he is not going in with the caravan. Again, the Feast of Booths is a big caravan. Families are coming from everywhere. They're bringing their shelters with them to set up, and the Jews are going to be on the lookout for all these people, caravans coming in to the Feast of Booths. So he says, y'all can go whenever, but they're trying to kill me. In verse 7, he says, the world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. So why is it that the world cannot hate the brothers of Jesus? At this time, they are both the same. World, world, all right? The world repels Christ. The world hates Christ. The world hates Christians. But what does the world do with the world? Embraces the world, loves the world, right? So here you have... The brothers of Christ, Jesus is saying, is right now one with that world. The world cannot hate world. They, they're going to find that they're going to be very welcome, specifically the, the world that Jesus is referring to there of the unbelieving Jews. The brothers are in that same group. All right, The brothers are one with the world's view of Jesus, therefore the world has no problem with these men. Uh, why did the world hate Jesus? Well, we found out a lot as we're going through the book of John, John chapter 6, they, they hate him because he claims to be God. He was God. But also here in this passage, we find out because he spoke about the world's sinfulness. He openly spoke about their sinfulness. You think back to other great men of God. You think of prophets. You can think of John the Baptist, right? Uh, he spoke openly about sin. And it ended up he was, had his head cut off because he spoke openly about sin they hated that. You think of Elijah. You think of Elisha. You think of Jeremiah. You think of any of the prophets. Jesus says, you've killed them all. Why did they kill them all? 
because they hated the message that was coming from their mouth from God. They had created their own religions and they thought they were, had peace with God. And then these prophets come in from God and say, no, no peace, no peace. You're living in sin and they hated them. Jesus is doing the same. He's coming in, speaking about sinfulness and the world doesn't like their sinfulness to be called sinfulness. Uh, I remember when Bodhi was here about a year ago, he, they, he said the world is changing everything the Bible refers to as sin to something else, right? So it's, it's a way of camouflaging the sin and calling it something else and then applauding it, praising it, and celebrating it as something really good. Uh, so the world hates it when Christ comes in and says, this is sin. Will the world hate it when you come in and say, this is sin? Uh, yeah, because again, you're revealing yourself as not of this world. Um, point of application here is, it is for these same reasons that the world can and will hate you as well. You may think that you're loved by the world of both believers and non-believers, but proclaim the truth about who Jesus truly is, that he is God, and speak about their sinfulness, and often their love for you will quickly disappear. The world has no problem with Christians who do not speak the truth about Jesus, sin and the need for salvation, because they think you are one of them. That makes a lot of sense. If the world thinks you're one of them, and yet you claim to be a Christian, yet the world can see no difference, you're probably just going to be treated as one with the world. There's not a lot of hatred that's going to come your direction. But again, why did they hate Jesus? Because he claimed to be God and because he spoke out against sinfulness. Oftentimes, if you do those things and you teach who Jesus truly is and you acknowledge sin as sin, the hatred can often come. Uh, does the world treat you more like the brothers of Jesus or like Jesus? And this is a good question to ask, right? The world loved the brothers. The brothers loved the world. They treated them kindly. Uh, Jesus comes in and they do not treat him kindly. Uh, not that this is an exact test of salvation, how the world treats you, but it is worth pondering. The world loves its own because it hates Christ. And sometimes Christians, and you know this, or you, all of us are guilty of this at some point, uh, but, but many Christians try to camouflage their Christianity and talk like and act like, to a degree, like the world around them so that they do not stick out. And this is a very dangerous place to be in. If you're trying to please the world, uh, we know who the father of the world is, and it's not God. It's the world is right there with following Satan, following the sons of disobedience, what we used to do when we were dead in our sins. If God has made you alive, you are to be a light on a hill, not more darkness on the hill, all right? You are to be a light wherever you're at. Uh, so is it possible that hatred could come your way when you proclaim who Jesus is and you speak out against sin. It's highly possible, highly probable that that is going to happen, all right? Look at John 15, 18 through 20. Hold your place there, but also turn to John 15, 18 through 20. And uh, we come to this passage quite often just to remind us, because it is a depressing thing to be hated by anyone. We, I mean, who in here just loves to be hated? There's no one that just loves to be hated, right? You don't want to walk out of here going today just, oh, I can't wait to be hated by all my coworkers. Can't be, wait to be hated by all my family members. I just love a good dose of hatred, you know? No, no one wants to be hated, but at the same time, the reality is if you're a bright light in a very dark world, hatred will come, and you'll have to wrestle with this. What do I do? Uh, should I, should, why is this happening to me? I've done nothing bad, right? I'm, I'm honoring God. I've proclaimed the gospel. Uh, uh, what, is this right or wrong? Just as it's, it's to be expected. All right, look at John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So this is a great reminder. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, like it did Jesus' brothers. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of this world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also, what? Persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So here we just see that this is, is pretty much automatic. All right? The world did not hate Jesus, and then the world fall in love with Christians after that. 
Remember something about Christians been eaten by lions and such and in the years to come, right? They were indeed persecuted. They were martyred. Many of them still are in much of the world, even as we, we, we live today, even right now. So the world hates Christians. Why? Because Jesus has pulled us out of the world. We're not citizens here. Our citizenship is in heaven. So we live with a whole different purpose in life, whole different direction, whole different motivation in life, and we should stand out. So don't put the camouflage of the world on you to try to blend in. It's okay to represent Christ brightly. All right, let's go and move on to John chapter 7, verse 8, 9 and 10. He goes on to say, you, you go up to the feast, as Jesus talked to his brothers. I'm not going up to the feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after this, his brothers had gone up to the feast. Then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So here we again see that Jesus is on his own timetable. He's not going with the flow just because his brothers did, even though they advised him. He goes in private. Now, six months later will be the next Passover feast, and Jesus will not come in privately to Jerusalem. He will come very openly, very publicly, riding on a donkey, if you remember. And it is a big public uh, uh, introdu introduction as he comes into Jerusalem. People are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they're, they're, everyone is seeing him, right? And this will be the trigger that, that stirs his arrest and his death as well. But this time, Jesus is coming in privately. And we'll get to what he teaches in privately uh, next Sunday. Look at verse 11. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, Where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, No, he is leading the people astray. All right? So here uh, we have the, the people know him, know of him. He had been at the other feast, two other Passover feasts. Uh, 20,000 people had been fed by Christ. All the signs, miracles, and wonders during the six months in Galilee. Uh, ever, no one else is doing such a thing. It's not like, oh, there's at least 100, 200, 300 other, other people who are walking on water and raising the dead and making the blind see and deaf to hear and the lame to walk. It's Jesus who is doing these. So everyone has heard, knows of, uh, that there is someone, a prophet, who is he? Uh, that's doing these signs, miracles, and wonders, and they're, they're wanting to talk openly about this. And where better to talk about it, right, than the, the center, epicenter of all things religious in, in Israel, for the Israelites, uh, on the place, uh, on the planet Earth. Like, this is it. God's temple is here. We are all here. There's, there's three mandatory feasts. All of our families are here with us. All of us are here. Let's hear what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the great scribes, the great priest of the temple has to say about who Jesus is. But nothing. They don't talk. They're, why do they not talk? Uh, they're scared. They are scared. They have fear. Who are they scared of? What are they scared of? They're scared of those in authority over them. They're in fear of the Jewish authorities. It says they're in fear of the Jews. They themselves are Jews, but here John uses that to speak of those in charge of the religious system that was there in place. Uh, so who is Jesus? And this is a question that comes up over and over and over through the book of John. And he's, he hits it at so many different angles, and he's just adding to the right definition of Jesus, but also at the same time revealing that many are not fully grasping and the whole definition of Jesus, and they're parting him out. I believe in this part of Jesus, or this, I believe that he is a, a prophet. I believe that he is a teacher. I believe that he could be the king of Israel over here, but there, I believe he, God is behind him because he's doing signs, like over there with Nicodemus, right? But there's so much more. Even here, they're cautiously mumbling amongst themselves, saying, some think that he is a good person. Well, that, that seems to be true, right? But then others say that he is an absolute deceiver, trying to lead the people astray. I wonder who started that. Uh, that would be something probably the Pharisees were spreading. Uh, they believed him to be a deceiver, leading the people away. They even accused him of, of being uh, having a demon at one time, right, to distract the people away from them. They really are the people of God. So you have mixed opinions here, but they're all quiet, and they're not talking because of fear. 
One of the questions we could ask ourselves is, why do you not openly speak about Jesus more often? Why do you not speak about Jesus more often? And instantly, you probably feel like somewhat of a clinch. Like, oh, that, oh, I, was, I was making fun of them a moment ago, but yeah, it's me. <laughs> it's like the fear is a real thing. Uh, most likely not fear of the Jewish authorities, right? Uh, but other fears, fear to go against the public popular opinion, which is of the world. Once you say that Jesus is God, uh, it puts you in a whole different category from the world, and that's the majority of people. So you're in a, in a, in a minority there. Uh, is it fear of those who are in authority? Could be. Is it fear of opposition? Fear of man is the greatest obstacle to evangelism. Why do we not share the gospel? Usually there's an underlying fear that's very similar to what the Jews who are wanting to talk about Jesus that day experience. As believers, we know who Jesus is and that he is the only hope for those who are currently unbelievers. Turn over to Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. We'll end with this passage today. Romans 10, 14. There is a natural fear to talk openly about Jesus and to call sin out for being sinful. We live in a dark world, and this is what we are commanded to do. Romans 10, 14 says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So this is, this is why it is so important for us as believers to recognize there are unbelievers. We are in the world. But those that we are around that are unbelievers, we are not to remain quiet. We still need to tell them. We need to proclaim who Jesus is and what he has done to bring about salvation and call them to faith. I love how Paul puts it here. Uh, the verse before it is, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Wonderful. And then Paul's like, but how can they call on the one they've never heard of? How can they believe in him unless someone tells them? And that someone that needs to tell them is you. You know people that I do not know. You will see people this week that I will not see. I will see people that you will not see. You work with people that I don't work with. You could pick anyone in this room, and you could probably name 20 people that someone over here will not see this week that you will see. What's the point? Each one of us has this command. How will they call on him if they have not, or believe in him if they have not even heard? Everyone who calls upon Jesus will be saved. What do they need? They need the gospel, right? Don't fear man. God has saved you. He's given you grace. You deserved eternity in hell. He is still the same cure for everyone else that you know. Open your mouth and tell people about Jesus. Let's end there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this wonderful salvation in Jesus Christ that we can rest in knowing that he is our Savior, that our sins have been paid for. Help us to, to fight against the fear of proclaiming these wonders to others. May we be bold. May we proclaim who Jesus truly is and that he is exclusively the way to heaven. God, I pray that there would be, we'd be encouraged, motivated to do such a thing. May we be more like those early Christians who went about proclaiming the gospel. Help us be more like Paul who acknowledged that everyone who calls upon you will be saved, but how can they call if they've never even heard? Help us to be the ones who open our mouths to evangelize, to proclaim the gospel, and to not fear man or to fear rejection or to fear anything. Lord, help us to acknowledge you are in control. God, uh, we thank you for the word that we've looked at today. Help us to, to shine brightly in this world. Help us not to be afraid to shine brightly. Help our lifestyles to line up with our beliefs. Convict us of the sin that is in our life, God, and help us to seek and to strive to live holy lives. In Jesus' name we pray.